so I'm talking a little bit about technology today um, and, its, and its history. But I'd first like to uh, raise a point. Um, you know how when you read history, you quite often imagine what you might be doing in that situation? I mean, when I read, you know, like ancient history and I read about, you know, the, uh, the death of Socrates or something, I imagine myself as a, you know, a, a, a Greek citizen, you know, what, what would I have done? Would I have supported him? You know, would I have opposed him? You know, I don't know. I would like to have gone back. You probably have your favorite period of history. You know, some people imagine themselves fighting it out during the Civil War or perhaps being there, you know, as part of the greatest generation at Iwo Jima or something like that. Um, well, so I want to share with you my, what my own sort of fantasy is about, about history. And that would be to be at the Chicago um, World's Fair in 1893, which, as far as I can tell, is like the most interesting thing that's ever happened in history. And hardly anybody ever talks about this. But... Um, this was in many ways the dawn of modernity as we know it, um, and the culmination of uh, a thousand years of capital accumulation, all sort of sitting in one city. Now, the, these World's Fairs were very interesting. Uh, they were common, I guess they're not really common anymore, and they sort of fell apart sometime in the middle of the, of the 20th century. But back in the day, in the, in the 19th century, World's Fairs were the place where um, uh, the great entrepreneurs and the great capitalists and the great uh, captains of industry and governments too would come and display their wares for the for the public, um, just to show what's coming. I mean, the, the 19th century was an age of uh, unbelievable optimism and hope. Actually, it's true that 18th century too, where people had a profound sense that that everything that lies in front of us is going to be progress. And what does progress mean? It means more peace more prosperity, more wealth for everyone, more gizmos, more fun things to do, spectacular stuff all around. So the world's, world's, world's fairs were times when um, all these things were kind of gathered in one place. You know, this is, this, is, this is your future. It gave you a chance to look at the future before it really came. Um, and that World's Fair in 1893, uh, the U.S., was in a unique position to reveal, really, to all people of the world, all the great things that were happening in this country. And great things were happening because, you know, the Civil War had, had ended, which is a, a catastrophic thing for the country. But very quickly, the country got back on track again so that uh, tariff barriers were low. We didn't uh, have a lot of barriers to imports and exports. The taxes were, you know... Uh, very, very low. There was no such thing as an income tax. Imagine. You make money, you keep it. That's the end. I mean, it's just, I have to say that out loud because it seems almost hard to believe. No income tax. We were on a gold standard, so we couldn't, we didn't have a situation like, like uh, Mark and Doug were talking about where a central banker could just crank out dollars endlessly. Uh, if a business failed, it failed. If a business succeeded, it profited. And that was true um, um, after the Civil War up until, uh, up until this, this great World's Fair. And remarkable things were happening. I mean, this is a, a period that's called in history the Gilded Age. It's called the Gilded Age. Okay, uh, Beautiful image um, of captains of industry amassing massive amounts of wealth. Uh, for, their, for themselves, but also, you know, they became benefactors to the public, both in terms of the great uh, th things they were doing with their, with their industries and the employment that they were able to create, but also in terms of the charitable activities. I was just in Pittsburgh, and uh, I went to the Pittsburgh Cathedral, which is one of the most beautiful buildings I've ever seen. Okay, so I haven't been to Chartres, I haven't seen the cathedrals there, but I can't imagine they're as grand and magnificent as the Pittsburgh Cathedral. Um, I mean... The pillars inside the church are as big around as like this room or something. I mean, the, the scale is, is beyond belief. I, I mean, it's the sort of thing you can't even imagine being built today. You can't even imagine such a thing existing. So I just inquired, well, when did it go up? Well, 1914, right? right at the end of the Gilded Age. And how did it come to be? They raised money from the workers and peasants? No. Uh, Andrew Carnegie wanted uh, to buy some land from the Archdiocese of Pittsburgh, 
So he said, but I tell you what, um, if you'll sell me this land, I'll build you a cathedral. I will build you a cathedral just down the street. And so the archdiocese agreed to it. And with his own money, he paid for this cathedral. Now, there was no revenue bounce back to this thing, right? It's not like building a casino in Las Vegas, you know, where you're expecting the returns to pay. No, it was a gift. It was a gift not only to uh, the Catholic Church, but and he himself was Episcopalian, by the way, but also to the whole of Pittsburgh and to the whole community. I mean, this is a grand achievement. You know, the, this kind of thing was very, very common. There was a, a great belief in the Gilded Age that America was giving rise to a new form of aristocrats. You know, they weren't lords and barons appointed by kings and queens, you know, and given land titles by virtue of their connections to the state or by virtue of their birth or their heritage, you know, and, uh, you know, walking around with titles. No, that was not America. The new aristocracy in America was going to be an aristocracy of merit. You know, if you did great things, then you could be known as a great person. So that's a cool system right? You, you provide jobs, you build great industries, you build brilliant businesses and advance civilization, then uh, you're highly regarded and respected. And then you can wear a top hat and strut down the street in fancy clothes, right? But that's not something you do by virtue of birth. It's something you do because of the things you've accomplished in your life. Now, America was great. It was a great country because this system was really born here. So between 1850 and uh, 1900, we saw unbelievable amounts of economic growth. I mean, there, were, there was a full decade, I think between 1880 and 1890, where the economy was growing as high as six and seven percent per year, okay? So this, there's unimaginable levels of growth. And a low growth in those days was considered, you know, four or five percent. There was no inflation. There were little miniature banking panics that came and went. A few big shots went belly up, and that was the end of it. You know, nobody inter intervened. There was no Keynesian fiscal policy. The government didn't spend, didn't have the money to spend, so they couldn't bail out anybody. They couldn't stimulate the economy with ridiculous projects. They didn't have the money. It was, it was not even a question. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, I should say, it, it wasn't just that... Um, uh, G GDP was, was essentially was, uh, was doubling, you know, like every 10 years during the Gilded Age. Imagine such a thing. And um, to keep in mind, wealth was increasing, per capita income was growing, as it had never grown in any country in all of human history. And keep in mind, this is an age of fantastic growth of immigration, too. So we had all these... Uh, countries in Europe, uh, the people from countries all over Europe were, were coming here from all over the world, really. So the population was booming, and people were living longer. I mean, in 1850, the average lifespan was, 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 was 40. So, like, I would not be giving the speech right now, <laughs> for sure. And some of you might not be here. By 1900, so the uh, lifespans had increased to 49, which still sounds low to us, but that was an unbelievable increase. I mean, we'd never seen anything like that in the whole history of the world, that people would be living the average lifespan was, uh, was, was, was 49, 49 years. And um, infant mortality was plummeting, the income was rising, economic growth was booming. And what was causing this? This was, uh, well, it was caused because of new technologies like railroads, um, new communications technologies, and just the accumulation of capital. I mean, as savings rose, their investment could rise too. And, um, and th this, this all kind of built on, on, uh, on, on this, this powerful foundation of, that capitalism had provided, uh, creating, therefore, you know, the, the most mighty economy in the entire world. And during this period, too, the U.S. passed uh, Britain in economic growth and overall wealth. So in other words, this is the place where it was happening. So 1893 comes and what kind of cool things were going on at the, at the Chicago uh, World's Fair? Well, the big thing was, well, let me just mention some small things. Scott Joplin was there playing ragtime. That's a neat little contribution, the foundation of modern jazz. You know, that was neat. Uh, some people say the hamburger was, was, was uh, uh, displayed at the World's Fair <laughs> the first time. I mean, there's big arguments about who invented the hamburger, but anyway. Uh, uh, some people lay claim to that there. And um, there was the, the Ferris wheel 
I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of this gigantic, the guy was named something Ferris, and he built this Ferris wheel, which is this gigantic round thing that held, I forget now how many hundreds of people it would, it would, it would put on this, on this wheel that went around and around. I mean, it must have just been amazing to look at in those days. But the big thing that everybody was talking about at Chicago World's Fair was electricity. So electricity was new. And there were two companies competing, each with their own uh, team of scientists and innovators uh, for who could provide the most smashing electrical displays, you know. And uh, this was a time, too, when electricity was, was a luxury, was becoming a luxury good, so that the, the, the great captains of industry would build gigantic new homes and they would wire it with electricity. So instead of lighting candles all over the house, as you had done from you know, the beginning of the history of time up until about this time. Now you could just push a button and the light would come on. How great is that? I mean, that's, we're talking about man conquering nature here. Unimaginable. We take all this stuff for granted. Actually, the electricity went out a couple of days ago at the Mises Institute. Really, it was like civilization just sort of died, you know, for like an hour and a half. You know, we all sat there, you know. It's kind of a scary prospect. Anyway, so electricity was the, was the really cool thing that was going on there. These were all luxury goods uh, that we saw. Oh, also the first uh, display of something approaching the modern movies, you know, uh, went on at the World's Fair. An exciting time of great, great progress. It was in many ways the culmination of everything that had come before, not only in this country but around the world in terms of economic exchange, capital investment, innovation, everything, all of it done by private entrepreneurs. So who funded the World's Fair? Well, you know, governments gave a little bit of contributions, but as I mentioned, in those days, governments didn't have much money at all. The whole thing in Chicago was funded by private enterprise. I mean, private money. We can't even imagine this sort of thing. I don't know what, you know, well, there's, yes, there's stashes of private wealth around nowadays, but n nothing that could fund something like a Chicago World Fair like we, like, we, like we saw back then. It's unbelievable. And there was no question that it was going to be funded by private money. That's the way things were done. And it was to show and put on display this beautiful thing, the practical art of technology and entrepreneurship. So you can imagine yourself coming out of this. The world, Civil War was, was a catastrophe. Then we had this great period of peace and prosperity, low taxes, no government involvement in anything, uh, huge accumulation of, of, of capital, the rise of a new uh, uh, aristocratic class in the United States based on, on not on, on title or grant of privilege from the government, but, but rather uh, by merit and achievement. And um, in 1893, you know, the literary writers at the time, what were they writing about? What were the great injustices that they were concerned that they concerned themselves with? Well, they were interested in things like penal reform. You know, we've got to make our prisons a little more humanitarian. You know, we've got to, we've got to uh, improve the way courts deal with issues of crime. Um, we've got to end um, uh, terrible squabbles between families and, and groups. I mean, in other words, they were small issues. They were important issues to them, but compared to what we dealt with in the 20th century, th these things were nothing. I mean, the, it seemed as if in 1893 that there were only just a few small improvements that needed to be made, into the, made to the world to make it, you know, a perfect place. A perfect place of peace, prosperity, and well-being for all. Endlessly increasing uh, lifespans, forever increasing technology, um, an ever nicer, more beautiful utopia for all people. That was 1893, and nobody could know what was coming. But what was coming? I mean, essentially, the end of civilization was coming. Nobody knew it. And we stumbled into it almost inadvertently, didn't we, with World War I, a war that hardly anybody today can even explain at all. I mean, how did it happen? A series of diplomatic missteps. And next thing you know, everybody's killing each other, bloodshed and death and destruction all over, the, all over the place. Governments are drafting people, sending them off to foreign lands to kill and be killed, and so on it went for years and years. And that was the beginning of the end, folks. That was the beginning of the end. And then, in 1913, we got the Federal Reserve, this magic money machine that permitted the government to create endless quantities of the thing that everybody wanted and debase the currency and fund the state and fund ever more wars. Um, and that led to all kinds of government planning, you know, um, and eventually 
because of the unresolved problems of World War I, uh, we got another world war that led to massacres, holocausts, gulags, and disaster. Then another 40 years of the Cold War, where half the world's population was shut, shut behind an iron curtain and cut off from, from exchange. You know, none of this, 100, 100 million people dead by government, at least, in the 20th century, at the hands of the state. Nobody could imagine such a thing in 1893, where everything was bright and beautiful. And then just like in an instant, everything turned to darkness. So I tell that story because, well, one reason is that we never really know what the future is going to hold. It's naive of us to believe that whatever good things that exist in the world today can't be taken away from us immediately. We can't know that for sure. All we can really do is work for good things and work against bad things so we can hope that we can provide a world for our children and their children that is more like the Gilded Age and less like the Holocaust and gulags of the 20th century. So how do we go about that? Well, one way is to think in terms of economics about the science of wealth, the science of things that lead to prosperity, so we can recreate the beautiful age of the guild. And by the way, you know, one of the things that's very interesting about today's intellectual elites and public culture, you've probably heard maybe a little bit about the Gilded Age. Maybe not that much, I don't know. Can anybody name a president from the Gilded Age? Probably not, right? Hey, that's good. You know, when you don't know the name of the president, things are probably going pretty well, you know? I, when presidents become famous, there's usually a problem. Some, something bad is, is brewing. So the Gilded Age, nobody even knows who those guys were. They're called the postage stamp presidents. He's, bring it back, I say, you know? Bring back presidents whose names we don't know. I was in Costa Rica one year, and um, I was stunned to learn that hardly anybody in Costa Rica knows the name of the president. And he lives in like a regular house, you know, like you would find in the suburbia or something like that. Seems like a pretty good system to me. So what does economics teach us about how to continue and perpetuate uh, peace and prosperity of the sort that we saw during the Gilded Age? Well, the main thing Mark mentioned and that's that we need to understand the source of wealth and the source of creativity and the source of innovation is not the public sector, rather it's the private sector. And it's not just um, private entrepreneurs need to understand this, also the public sector needs to un understand this. Um, if, if you're in the military, for example, uh, I mean, I think the American military has learned over the years to dis and discovered that the private enterprise is going to be the main source of all the great innovations that are, that are being used by the military. I mean, every great military um, will ultimately have to depend primarily on the products of private enterprise, because that's where the innovations come from. Uh, but more importantly than that, um, uh, in the private sector we find features that lead to wealth creation that do not exist in the public sector. For one thing, in the private sector, you have a clear goal. I mean, like everything in the world's fair. Okay, think about all the goods of the world's fair. What is the point of all that stuff? The point is to serve the consuming public. So there's a goal. The goal is to find things that people want and can afford and provide those things to them. I mean, every private enterprise in the whole world is devoted to that end mainly. If you achieve that goal, you profit. If you don't achieve that goal, you lose money. And there's nothing in between. You know, profit's a bad word to people these days. Uh, it was very strange to me. I mean, it's like, well, you either have profits or you have losses. You know, I mean, are we supposed to favor losses? I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with profits. Profits are the reward, are, are the sign and the signal that you've done well, that you've served the public in the best possible way. People talk about these, the, the tycoons of the Gilded Age and how evil they were, the robber barons. Well, what, what, was the, what was their goal? What was their primary purpose? Whether it was coal or railroads or, or, or steel or whatever your industry was, electricity, the goal was to make human life better for the people on this earth. That's a beautiful image. It's a wonderful thing. So there's a clear goal in the private sector. In the public sector, there's not so much a clear goal, is there? Um, I once went to a seminar that was sponsored, just because I was curious, by the Department of Human Services in the Washington, D Washington uh, bureaucracy. 
and they had like a jobs fair. And a, and a person uh, stood up and they said, well, you know, our department, uh, we're part of a great growth industry. Um, last year we managed to get you know, 10,000 new people on welfare. Uh, next year, we hope to get another, you know, say, 20,000 new people on welfare. And this means jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, uh, you know, I mean, this is a strange goal. I mean, this is not exactly serving the consumers. It's a, it's a different kind of goal. It's, it's a goal of building the bureaucracy and building its clients. So in the private sector, there's always a goal. In the private sector, both the risk and the reward for everything you do is always borne by the owners of the things being invested. Um, that is not true in the public sector. Um, every day we listen to interviews with politicians who tell us all the things they want to do. Well, what if their plans don't work? How do we know? What's the test? We don't really have a test. And let's say we did have a test and we can declare their programs to be failures. Are they going to pay a price for this? Not really. They're just going to get sort of slink away, you know, or come up with some bogus excuse. I mean, there's, ultimately there's no... Uh, there's no punishment in the public sector for doing bad things instead of uh, good things. One of the reasons I like uh, Donald Trump, you know, for all of his uh, uh, disgusting habits, is that he puts his name all over everything. You know, so if anything goes wrong, you always know who to blame. And he's always willing to take the blame. I mean, this is typical in private, private, enter private enterprise. There's a tremendous accountability always, always, always there. In the private sector, there's the ability to calculate profit and loss. And that's the number one most powerful tool that is enjoyed by, the, by private enterprise that, that government does not have access to. Um, every day, at the end of the day, you've got to balance the books. And the price signals that you're given permit you to uh, calculate whether what you have done is the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, in, a, in, a, in a bureaucratic uh, world, those price signals do not exist. Ultimately, you're, you're guessing, really. Um, and this is true even when it comes to budget cuts. Um, for example, um, if I own a uh, cupcake uh, shop on the other side of town, and I go for a full, mo a full month with losing money, and I'm facing serious problems, I'm going to have to look at my, my, my books to try to figure out where I can cut back, where I can buy cheaper ingredients, which, whether I need to fire employees, whether I need to use le less electricity, maybe not st stay open as many hours, or maybe I, I need to stay open longer hours and uh, serve even more consumers so I can get more revenue. Whatever the results are, there's always, an, always constantly a test, and the test is the profit and loss test. In bureaucracies, um, it's completely different because you know an order will come down that says, well, we had planned to grow your revenue um, five percent next year. It turns out it's only going to grow three percent. So whatever expansions you had planned, they need to be cuts. Well, where? Where do you cut? Where do you cut when the money stops coming in? Nobody really knows for sure, and there's no real test to know whether you're doing the right thing. Ultimately, it's polit it's a political decision, and it's not an economic decision. The other interesting thing about the private sector is that the private sector is careful to not introduce technology before its time has come. Um, in the 20th century, we found governments in love with the idea of, of technology, like um, space travel was very enticing you know, to Russia. And then uh, US politicians got very jealous of Russia's interest in space. So we funded this gigantic space program too. Well, you know, whether space travel is the right thing or not, it's hard to say in the abstract. All technology comes in its time. And te technology that's really serving consumers has to be introduced not at the expense of other things, but in accord with the preferences of, of the public. Governments will typically ignore this sort of thing. Um, they will just kind of look out and say, well, you know, it strikes me that we've got to create a lot of, a lot of jobs, so let's take 10 years and build a gigantic dam here, and that will have some spin-off effects of creating electricity, okay? Well, that's a very interesting idea, but how do we know that that's the right decision? I mean, can you do this abstractly, really? Do we know for sure this is the right time, the right place, the right use of these resources? We don't know for sure. Ultimately, it's a political decision. So no technology comes before its time. Some people say that um, the government should be given great credit for inventing 
the internet? Well, um, in the first place, the internet we use today, government had virtually nothing to do with it. Uh, the, 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 the infrastructure was created long ago by the government for serving uh, government purposes, but it was the private sector that, that put the fire under it, that made it, that made it serve the public in, in such a beautiful way. Um, the other thing is, um, I mean, even when technology comes about by virtue of public investment, we don't know for sure that that's the best use of those resources at any one time. I mean, the essential economic problem we're always dealing with is that there are two kinds of goods in the world. There are scarce goods and there are non-scarce goods. Like this speech I'm giving you is a non-scarce good. You can take it with you, but it doesn't take it away from me, right? A song I sing you, you can go out singing that song. It doesn't take that song away from me. It's very beautiful. Lots of non-scarce goods in the world. Information, mainly. Pictures, sounds. There's no reason to restrict or allocate these things or ration them once they're made public. They're for everybody. That's not true in the physical world. This podium I'm speaking from, this book, one copy so far, uh, all, all the uh, chairs you sit in, all the clothes you wear, all the food you eat, everything you can, you can see and touch, these are all scarce goods, which is a way of saying that there really isn't enough in existence right now to serve everybody who would like to have it. So there has to be some mechanism we use to allocate these things. We can either allocate those things through political decisions, or we can allocate them through economic decisions. The economic decisions use markets and prices and private owners. Political decisions use things like public demand dates and uh, force and bureaucracies. Those are the essential choice that we face. And I think as the illustration of the Gilded Age gives us, if we can unleash this power of private enterprise to do amazing things, innovate, distribute, compete, it's a beautiful thing, then we can see a beautiful world emerge before our eyes, something like what was emerging after the Civil War and before World War I where we saw unrelenting progress, unrelenting progress in incomes, lifespans, uh, in, in, in every way. I mean, during that period, we saw the seemingly impossible accomplished, expanding population, people living longer, growing wealthier, vast immigration, and huge amount of economic growth all coming together at once. That is a gigantic apparatus created entirely by the private sector and the private sector alone. When we turned in the 20th century towards systems of government planning, we, we wrecked in many ways the possibilities of the private sector to accomplish similar miracles. However, at the end of the Cold War, we saw the opening up of that whole world that had been shut behind the Iron Curtain. Now we see uh, all of these countries introduced into the worldwide division of labor. So now we can, we can trade, we can trade with China, we're, we're trading with, with Russia and all the former client states of the Soviet Union. Millions and millions and really billions of people newly introduced into the world exchange system. And as a result we're seeing, uh, we've, we've seen fantastic innovation. We're living in the, 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 the age of the digital revolution, which in many ways is just as spectacular as the first and second industrial revolution. And this is mainly because of the elimination of government controls from major parts of the world. At the same time, we're seeing pressure in the other direction towards ever more and more control. The things that Mark and Doug were talking about, the attempts at uh, 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 stimulating the economy through the printing press, through uh, government spending, and all these phony mechanisms that, that they, they tell us is going to make us richer. They don't. They all make us poor because they take away our freedom. That new book is called The Jetsons World, Private Miracles and Public Crimes. Um, that sort of sums up what I, what I think we should all hope for. It's something like the, the old world that, lived on, that existed in that show called The Jetsons. That's what I think of as a kind of a space age, gilded age, you know. Um, amazing gizmos all over the place. Bourgeois society continues to exist as it always has. Peace and prosperity for all. This is the dream of all the great philosophers 
all the great economists, all the great thinkers of all ages. And it truly is within our grasp, provided we take the right steps and not the wrong ones. Thank you very much. Thank you.